Hi, Year 13. This um, lecture is looking at Merton, uh, Merton strain theory. Um, as um, we talked about in the last lecture, that is Merton on the left-hand side, the grey um, and black photo, grey and white photo with glasses. Uh, again, sorry, these boxes have gone blank for some reason. Durkheim at the top, and then Merton would be in the other blue box. And in the right-hand green box, you'd have subcultural theories. And then along the bottom, uh, left to right, you have got Albert Cohen, in the middle, you'd have Cloward and Olin, and on the right-hand box, you'd have um, Miller. And at the bottom down there, we've got David Matzer, who we will come to, who evaluates uh, particularly the subcultural approach um, to um, crime and deviance. So, strain theory, um, Robert Merton. Um, Robert Merton uh, argued that in a capitalist society, the dominant goal that most people aim for is, well, what do you think it might be in a capitalist society? And he is an interesting functionalist because he is a functionalist, but yet some of his ideas do sound a little bit Marxist. So just be wary that you don't end up talking about him as a Marxist because he's not. So hopefully you've worked out what that goal possibly is. Um, in fact, he argued people become so concerned with the goal of getting super rich that the means of attaining the goal becomes irrelevant. Now, Merton, when he wrote, particularly, he was focusing on what he called the American dream that everyone had, like own the house, the white picket fence, have a car, have a family, be well respected, have status, these, and have material goods. Okay, that was a key part of it as well. Um, he said, this is a real problem because even though we might all have this goal of becoming rich, uh, not all social groups have the same chance of achieving the goals set by society. Um, so can you think of what groups might not have the same opportunity of getting rich at the end? Um, so maybe think about what you've learnt in um, education in particular. Um, but don't forget um, other social factors as well. Um, he argues this then causes a strain between the goals that everybody shares, because as a society we all share the same goals according to functionalists. This causes a strain between the goals and the means of achieving them, which leads to crime, if you like. And he argued this is because something called anime um, emerges. So when you have a strain between your goals and your means of achieving them, you can sort of feel um, separate, if you like. Think about anime was like no longer feeling part of the collective consciousness, not, not longer having a, a strong, firm grounding in, in what you were doing and where you were going. So he said anime, uh, which is a concept that Durkheim doesn't really go into too much detail about, is a result of opportunities being blocked. You might no longer feel you, you can conform to the collective consciousness. So, for example, he said conformists, um, he would say conformists succeed in school and get well-paid jobs and they become rich. Okay? So people who conform, who do try hard, work hard, do, do well and get well-paid jobs and become super rich. Um, but what happens when strain occurs? So what happens to those people um, who uh, don't want to work? What happens to those people who, no matter how hard they work, they don't do well? Well, he says strain occurs. And he said there are four particular adaptations to this strain. The first one is one that we'll probably talk about most because it's a, it generally leads to crime. So you get the innovator. They're the ones that accept the goals, but they reject le legitimate means of achieving them. So they don't want to try hard at school necessarily. But even if they have tried hard at school and they fail, uh, instead of trying hard again, they may well try and gain material wealth illegally. So it might be drug dealing. It could be fraud. It could be any crime that's linked to becoming materially more wealthy. You then get these people, I think are quite sad, the ritualists. Um, they give up on ever achieving the goals of the massive house and the nice car, um, but they might continue to go through the ritual of working hard because that is what ex is expected of them. And sorry, this has been kind of uh, mangled a bit when it's been uploaded. Essentially, that boils down to they, they will go to work, try hard, even though they're not being rewarded, even though they're not getting the promotions, um, but they'll do it to try and gain respect by working hard and being a good citizen. So the ritualist won't turn to crime necessarily, but I'm not entirely sure they'd be that happy. Now, the retreatist um, is a bit more interesting. This is where you get deviance again. This is when someone actually withdraws from society by giving up on the goals and the means of achieving them. So they completely um, give up. And, and this is when you get deviant behaviour or even criminal behaviour like alcoholism and drug abuse. 
Um, this is always one I use an example of like, you know, um, when people maybe get really bad exam results in the summer, do they sort of pick themselves up and think, right, I'm going to retake and redo, or do they just kind of give up, stop wanting to go out, you know, possibly drink excessively and ignore the problems? Hopefully none of you. Um, and finally, you get the rebels, okay? These are the people um, who reject society's means and the goals and replace them with your own, okay? And this is when you might get violent, you might get graffiti, you might get squatters. Um, generally, people who don't even want the goals of the big house and the family and the posh car, they have completely different goals set and they reject all the means of achieving them as well. So you do see elements of deviance, but this is also the groups that maybe just live very different types of lifestyles, like maybe sort of communal, hippie communes, if you like. So here is a diagram just to illustrate what I was um, talking about. You've got the conformists going straight to the goal. If you want to remind yourself, what are these goals? It's not just one goal. What are the different goals that we all end up sharing? Okay, right from educational success all the way up to being rich, if you like. Uh, then you've got the retreatists um, who give up in the goal and just kind of retreat into themselves, drink and drugs and alcohol. Uh, then you get the ritualists who keep on trying to achieve their goals, even though they never will, uh, to try and gain respect from other people. You get the innovators, definitely more likely to be the criminals who go around the legitimate ways of achieving the goals, and the rebels who don't care about the means and they don't care about the goals either. So when we think about uh, Merton, there are a couple of criticisms that can be laid at his door. Okay, Remember, he is a functionalist. Um, so there is an argument there's no such thing as common goals. And when we study Walter Miller, he does make this criticism. Um, there's no goals that everybody strives to achieve. Okay, so can you think of what sorts of factors would achieve, would affect, sorry, the goals that you have? So you guys might all want educational success, but maybe people of your age have completely different goals. And can you think what they might be? Um, and would someone from a different ethnic background, would they have a different goal set possibly? Someone from a different class background or even gender? So maybe he's being too um, optimistic to say that we all end up sharing the same goals. Like, do we have slightly different goal sets? Also, a big criticism of Merton is that his model cannot explain crimes of passion and it doesn't take into account um, the fact that sometimes people commit a crime without even rationally thinking about it. It just happens because they're jealous, because they're angry, uh, and actually very few sociological theories can um, explain crimes of passion, so it is worth using this maybe a few times when you're evaluating the different perspectives on crime and deviance. Um, so Messner and Rosenfield, um, they were functionists with a little bit of Marxism, which is a bit of a contradiction in terms, but you'll see what I mean as I go through this. They developed from Merton's model what they called institutional anime theory. Um, and again, it is very much about America. Um, they were very interested in why America's crime rate is so much higher than most other developed countries. It's way higher than the UK. They argued that actually it was something to do with an institutionalised obsession with individual success in capitalist America. Uh, uh, very much uh, leading to a winner-takes-all on anything-goes attitude, which is similar to what Marx used to call like the dog-eat-dog -dog world of, Mar of capitalism. So at all levels, all institutions are obsessed with individual success, whether it's education, whether it's family, whether it's competitive sports. And you can see that all over the media, if you like, in America. Now, they said uh, this leads to increased individualization. You know, people are less interested in collective good. And this individualization, that's what's driving anime, because people feel more and more self-interested, so they feel less connected to the collective consciousness around them. Now, again, they said maybe this is happening in America, because America is a society that lacks good welfare. So this can make crime inevitable. Their evidence is that countries with higher levels of welfare provision for the poor, for example, the UK with the NHS, crime levels are much lower. So this is probably something to do with relative deprivation. Okay? So remember, if you think about America, they haven't got an NHS, and things like if people get ill and they haven't got health insurance, they, they just stay ill. There's not very little that can go on in America. So actually, um, sometimes crime can be driven by serious material needs out there. Um, they said that economic goals take priority over all other, other goals in all institutions. And they called something, like what they said, is a fetishism of money. Okay? So even schools, for example, um, they, they prepare students to work 
in order to earn money at the expense of other values such as respect. And sometimes when you go around open evenings, you can see, you know, study maths and earn this much money, study this subject and earn this much money. And perhaps the focus is that in schools is that making you guys economically productive as opposed to making you sort of good and lovely human beings. Um, now, some of the evidence to kind of support their point of view is from, comes from a sociologist called Savelsberg. Um, and they said, after the collapse of communism and the introduction of capitalism to Eastern Europe, we saw crime rates shot up. Okay, so you had um, organised crime, uh, crime syndicates, you had arms dealing, all types of crime shot up across um, Eastern Europe. Now, they argued this is evidence that capitalism itself creates crime. Now, your evaluation for that might be that um, crime was occurring within those countries when communism was in place, but perhaps the state has such high control over things like media, we just didn't find out about it. So you can AO2 that point as well. Okay, thank you for listening to this short lecture on the strain theory. Remember, it fits within the functionalist framework because they talk about shared goals, okay, and everyone sharing the same goal, which is part of value consensus. Um, next um, lecture, we'll look at subcultural theories that focus a lot more on the norms and values that dictate criminal behaviour. Thank you.